Welcome to Tom Reads Books, the podcast where, whatever you're doing, I take you on an adventure through some of literature's most loved treasures. If you do enjoy the podcast, make sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode, and also check out the Patreon at patreon.com slash tomreadsbooks, where I release two exclusive episodes every week of a completely different book, full audiobook versions of all books read, and you can help choose future books for me to read. Now, though, I'd like to invite you to settle in, relax, and let me tell you a story. Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Continuing chapter nine. She was absent such a while that Joseph proposed we should wait no longer. He cunningly conjectured they were staying away in order to avoid hearing his protracted blessing. They were ill enough for only foul manners, he affirmed and on their behalf he added that night a special prayer to the usual quarter of an hour's supplication before meat, and would have tacked another to the end of the grace had not his young mistress broken in upon him with a hurried command that he must run down the road and, wherever Heathcliff had rambled, find and make him re-enter directly. I want to speak to him, and I must, before I go upstairs, she said and the gate is open, he is somewhere out of hearing, for he would not reply, though I shouted at the top of the fold as loud as I could. Joseph objected at first, she was too much in earnest, however, to suffer contradiction, and at last he placed his hat on his head and walked grumbling forth. Meanwhile Catherine paced up and down the floor, exclaiming, I wonder where he is, I wonder where he can be. What did I say, Nelly? I've forgotten. Was he vexed at my bad humour this afternoon? Dear, tell me what I've said to grieve him. I do wish he'd come. I do wish he would. What a noise for nothing, I cried, though rather uneasy myself. What a trifle scares you. It's surely no great cause of alarm that Heathcliff should take a moonlight saunter on the moors, or even to lie too sulky to speak to us in the hayloft. I'll engage he's sulking there, see if I don't ferret him out. I departed to renew my search. Its result was disappointment, and Joseph's quest ended in the same. That lad gets worse and worse, observed he on re-entering. He's left the gate fully open, and Mrs. Pony has trodden down two fields of corn and blundered through right over into meadow. However, Master will complain badly in the morning, and he'll do well. He is patience itself with such carelessness, worthless creatures. Patience itself he is. But he'll not be so always. You'll see all of you. You mustn't upset him for nothing. Have you found Heathcliff, you ass? Interrupted Catherine. Have you been looking for him as I ordered? Oh, I'd much rather look for the horse, he replied. It would make more sense. But I can look for neither horse nor man on a night like this, as black as the chimney. And Heathcliff's not the kind of boy to come at my whistle. It is likely he will be less hard of hearing with you. It was a very dark evening for summer. The clouds appeared inclined to thunder, and I said we had better all sit down. The approaching rain would be certain to bring him home without further trouble. However, Catherine would not be persuaded into tranquility. She kept wandering to and fro, from the gate to the door, in a state of agitation which permitted no repose, and at length took up a permanent situation on one side of the wall near the road, where, heedless of my expostulations in the growing thunder and the great drops that began to splash around her, she remained, calling at intervals and then listening and then crying outright. (laughs) She beat Harriton or any child at a good, passionate fit of crying. About midnight, while we still sat up, the storm came rattling over the heights in full fury. There was a violent wind as well as thunder, and either one or the other split a tree off the corner of the building, 
A huge bough fell across the roof and knocked down a portion of the east chimney stack, sending a clatter of stones and soot into the kitchen fire. We thought a bolt had fallen in the middle of us, and Joseph swung onto his knees beseeching the Lord to remember the patriarchs Noah and Lot, and, as in former times, spare the righteous, though he smote the ungodly. I felt some sentiment that it must be a judgment on us also. The Jonah, in my mind, was Mr. Earnshaw, and I shook the handle of his den that I might ascertain if he were yet living. He replied audibly enough, in a fashion which made my companion vociferate more clamorously than before that a wide distinction might be drawn between saints like himself and sinners like his master. But the uproar passed away in twenty minutes, leaving us all unharmed, excepting Cathy, who got thoroughly drenched for her obstinacy in refusing to take shelter, and standing bonnetless and shawless to catch as much water as she could with her hair and clothes. She came in and lay down on the settle, all soaked as she was, turning her face to the back and putting her hands before it. Well, miss, I exclaimed, touching her shoulder, you are not bent on getting your death, are you? Do you know what o'clock it is? Half past twelve, come, come to bed. There's no use waiting longer on that foolish boy. He'll be gone to Gimmerton and he'll stay there now. He guesses we shouldn't wake for him to this late hour. At least, he guesses that only Mr. Hindley would be up, and he'd rather avoid having the door opened by the master. No, no, he's not at Gimmerton, said Joseph. I expect he's at the bottom of a bog. This visitation wasn't for nothing, and I would advise you to watch out, miss. You might be the next. Thank heaven for all. It all works out for good for those that are chosen, and picked out from the rubbish. You know what the scripture says. And he began quoting several texts, referring us to the chapters and verses where we might find them. I, having vainly begged the willful girl to rise and remove her wet things, left him preaching and her shivering, and betook myself to bed with little Harriton, who slept as fast as if everyone had been sleeping round him. I heard Joseph read on a while afterwards. Then I distinguished his slow step on the ladder, and then I dropped to sleep. Coming down somewhat later than usual, I saw, by the sunbeams piercing the chinks of the shutters, Miss Catherine still seated near the fireplace. The house door was ajar, too. Light entered from its unclosed windows. Hindley had come out and stood on the kitchen hearth, haggard and drowsy. What ails you, Cathy? He was saying when I entered. You look as dismal as a drowned whelp. Why are you so damp and pale, child? I have been wet. She answered reluctantly, and I am cold. That's all. Oh, she is naughty, I cried, perceiving the master to be tolerably sober. She got steeped in the shower of yesterday evening, and there she sat the night through, and I couldn't prevail on her to stir. Mr. Earnshaw stared at us in surprise. The night through, he repeated. What kept her up? Not fear of the thunder, surely. That was over hours since. Neither of us wished to mention Heathcliff's absence, as long as we could conceal it, so I replied, I didn't know how she took it into her head to sit up, and she said nothing. The morning was fresh and cool. I threw back the lattice, and presently the room filled with sweet scents from the garden, but Catherine called peevishly to me. Ellen, shut the window. I'm starving. And her teeth chattered as she shrunk closer to the almost extinguished embers. She's ill, said Hindley, taking her wrist. I suppose that's the reason she would not go to bed, damn it. I don't want to be troubled with more sickness here. What took you into the rain? Running after the lads as usual, croaked Joseph, catching an opportunity from our hesitation to thrust in his evil tongue. If I were you, master, I'd just slam the doors in their faces, all of them, simple as that. Never a day goes by when you're away, but that son of Linton comes sneaking here, and Miss Nelly, she's a fine one. She sits there watching for you in the kitchen, and as you come in at one door, he's out the other, and then our grand lady goes a-courting herself. It's fine behaviour, lurking in the fields after twelve at night, with that foul, 
frightening devil of a gypsy Heathcliff. They think I'm blind, <laughs> but I'm not. Nothing of the sort. I saw young Linton both coming and going, and I saw you directing his discourse to me. You good-for-nothing slovenly witch, run up and into the house the minute you heard the master's horse coming up the road. Silence, eavesdropper, cried Catherine. None of your insolence before me. Edgar Linton came yesterday by chance, Hindley, and it was I who took him to be off, because I knew you would not like to have met him as you were. You lie, Cathy, no doubt, answered her brother, and you are a confounded simpleton. But never mind, Linton, at present. Tell me, were you not with Heathcliff last night? Speak the truth now. You need not be afraid of harming him, though I hate him as much as ever. He did me a good turn a short time since, that will make my conscience tender of breaking his neck. To prevent it, I shall send him about his business this very morning, and after he's gone, I'd advise you all to look sharp. I shall only have the more humour for you. I never saw Heathcliff last night, answered Catherine, beginning to sob bitterly. And if you do turn him out of doors, I'll go with him. But perhaps he'll never have an opportunity. Perhaps he's gone. <laughs> Here she burst into uncontrollable grief, and the remainder of her words were inarticulate. Hindley lavished on her a torrent of scornful abuse, and bid her get to her room immediately, or she shouldn't cry for nothing. I obliged her to obey, and I shall never forget what a scene she acted when we reached her chamber. It terrified me. I thought she was going mad, and I begged Joseph to run for the doctor. It proved the commencement of delirium. Mr. Kenneth, as soon as he saw her, pronounced her dangerously ill. She had a fever. He bled her, and he told me to let her live on whey and water gruel, and take care she did not throw herself downstairs or out of the window. And then he left, for he had enough to do in the parish where two or three miles was the ordinary distance between cottage and cottage. Though I cannot say I made a gentle nurse, and Joseph and the master were no better, and though our patient was as wearisome and headstrong as a patient could be, she weathered it through. Old Mrs. Linton paid us several visits, to be sure, and set things to rights, and scolded and ordered us all. And when Catherine was convalescent, she insisted on conveying her to Thrushcross Grange, for which deliverance we were very grateful. But the poor dame had reason to repent of her kindness. She and her husband both took the fever and died within a few days of each other. Our young lady returned to us, saucier and more passionate and haughtier than ever. Heathcliff had never been heard of since the evening of the thunderstorm, and one day I had the misfortune, when she had provoked me exceedingly, to lay the blame of his disappearance on her, where indeed it belonged as she well knew. From that period, for several months, she ceased to hold any communication with me, save in the relation of a mere servant. Joseph fell under a ban also. He would speak his mind and lecture her all the same as if she were a little girl, and she esteemed herself a woman and our mistress, and thought that her recent illness gave her a claim to be treated with consideration. Then the doctor had said she would not bear crossing much. She ought to have her own way, and it was nothing less than murder in her eyes for anyone to presume to stand up and contradict her. From Mr. Earnshaw and his companions she kept aloof and tutored by Kenneth, and serious threats of a fit that often attended her rages, her brother allowed her whatever she pleased to demand, and generally avoided aggravating her fiery temper. He was rather too indulgent in humouring her caprices. Not from affection, but from pride, he wished earnestly to see her bring honour to the family by an allegiance with the Lintons, and, as long as she let him alone, she might trample us like slaves for all he cared. Edgar Linton, as multitudes have been before, and will be after him, was infatuated, and believed himself the happiest man alive on the day he led her to Gimmerton Chapel, three years subsequent to his father's death. Much against my inclination, I was persuaded to leave Wuthering Heights and accompany her there. Little Harriton was nearly five years old, and I had just begun to teach him his letters. We made a sad parting, but Catherine's tears were more powerful than ours. When I refused to go, and when she found her entreaties did not move me, 
she went lamenting to her husband and brother. The former offered me munificent wages. The latter ordered me to pack up. He wanted no woman in the house, he said, now that there was no mistress. And as to Harriton, the curate should take him in hand by and by. And so I had but one choice left, to do as I was ordered. I told the master he got rid of all decent people only to run to ruin a little faster. I kissed Harriton goodbye, and since then he has been a stranger. And it's very queer to think it, but uh, I've no doubt he has completely forgotten all about Helen Dean and that he was ever more than all the world to her and she to him. At this point of the housekeeper's story, she chanced to glance towards the timepiece over the chimney and was in amazement on seeing the minute hand measure half past one. She would not hear of staying a second longer. In truth, I rather felt disposed to defer the sequel of her narrative myself, and now that she has vanished to her rest, and I have meditated for another hour or two, I shall summon courage to go, also, in spite of aching laziness of head and limbs. Chapter 10 A charming introduction to a hermit's life. Four weeks' torture, tossing and sickness. Oh, these bleak winds and bitter northern skies and impassable roads and dilatory country surgeons. And oh, this death of the human physiognomy. And, worse than all, the terrible intimation of Kenneth that I need not expect to be out of doors till spring. Mr. Heathcliff has just honoured me with a call. About seven days ago he sent me a brace of grouse, the last of the season. Scoundrel! He is not altogether guiltless in this illness of mine, and that I had a great mind to tell him. But, alas, how could I offend a man who was charitable enough to sit at my bedside a good hour and talk on some other subject than pills and draughts, blisters and leeches? This is quite an easy interval. I am too weak to read, yet I feel as if I could enjoy something interesting. Why not have up Mrs. Dean to finish her tale? I can recollect its chief incidents as far as she had gone. Yes, I remember her hero had run off and never been heard of for three years, and the heroine was married. I'll ring. She'll be delighted to find me capable of talking cheerfully. Mrs. Dean came. It wants twenty minutes, sir, to take in the medicine. Away with it, I replied. I desire to have... The doctor says you must drop the powders. With all my heart, don't interrupt me. Come and take your seat here. Keep your fingers from that bitter phalanx of vials. Draw your knitting out of your pocket. That'll do. Now continue the history of Mr. Heathcliff. From where you left off to the present day. Did he finish his education on the continent and come back a gentleman? Or did he get a sizer's place at college? Or escape to America and earn honours by drawing blood from his foster country? <laughs> or make a fortune more promptly on the English highways. He may have done a little in all these vocations, Mr. Lockwood, but I couldn't give my word for any. I stated before that I didn't know how he gained his money, neither am I aware of the means he took to raise his mind from the savage ignorance into which it was sunk. But, with your leave, I'll proceed in my own fashion, if you think it will amuse and not weary you. Are you feeling better this morning? Much. That's good news. I got Miss Catherine and myself to thrust cross Grange, and to my agreeable disappointment she behaved infinitely better than I dared to expect. She seemed almost over-fond of Mr. Linton, and even to his sister. She showed plenty of affection. They were both very attentive to her comfort, certainly. It was not the thorn bending to the honeysuckles, but the honeysuckles embracing the thorn. There was no mutual concessions. One stood erect, and the others yielded and who can be ill-natured and bad-tempered when they encounter neither opposition nor indifference. I observed that Mr. Edgar had a deep-rooted fear of ruffling her humour. He concealed it from her, but if ever he heard me answer sharply or saw any other servant grow cloudy at some imperious order of hers, he would show his trouble by a frown of displeasure that never darkened on his own account. He many a time spoke sternly to me about my pertness, and averred that a stab of a knife could not inflict a worse pang than he suffered at seeing his lady vexed. Not to grieve a kind master, I learnt to be less touchy, and for the space of half a year the gunpowder lay as harmless as sand, because no fire came near to explode it. 
Catherine had seasons of gloom and silence now and then. They were respected with sympathising silence by her husband, who ascribed them to an altercation in her constitution produced by her perilous illness, as she was never subject to depression of spirits before. The return of Sunshine was welcomed by answering Sunshine from him. I believe I may assert that they were really in possession of deep and growing happiness. It ended. Well, we must be for ourselves in the long run. The mild and generous are only more justly selfish than the domineering, and it ended when circumstances caused each to feel that the one's interest was not the chief consideration in the other's thoughts. On a mellow evening in September, I was coming from the garden with a heavy basket of apples which I had been gathering. It had got dusk, and the moon looked over the high wall of the court, causing undefined shadows to lurk in the corners of numerous projected portions of the building. I set my burden on the house steps by the kitchen door and lingered to rest, and drew in a few more breaths of the soft, sweet air. My eyes were on the moon and my back to the entrance, when I heard a voice behind me say, Nelly, is that you? It was a deep voice, and foreign in tone, yet there was something in the manner of pronouncing my name which made it sound familiar. I turned about to discover who spoke, fearfully for the doors were shut and I had seen nobody in approaching the steps. Something stirred in the porch, and moving nearer, I distinguished a tall man dressed in dark clothes with dark face and hair. He leant against the side and held his fingers on the latch as if intending to open for himself. Who can it be? I thought. Mr. Earnshaw? Oh no, the voice was no resemblance to his. I have waited her an hour. He resumed while I continued staring. And the whole of that time all round has been as still as death. I dared not enter. You do not know me. Look, I am not a stranger. A ray fell on his features. The cheeks were sallow and half covered with black whiskers, the brows lowering, the eyes deep-set and singular. I remembered the eyes. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Tom Reads Books podcast. If you'd like to support the show, leaving a rating and a short review on whatever podcast platform you're using really goes a long way to help us reach new listeners. Other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I look forward to reading to you again very soon.